Yes. Okay. So uh, hi everyone, um, and welcome to this uh, online economics of platforms seminar. So today our speaker is uh, Nikhil Velody from uh, Paris School of Economics. Very happy to have him. Um, so Nikhil will uh, speak for 40 minutes about ratings, design, and barriers to entry. And then this presentation will be followed by a discussion by Marianne Saidi from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so a few things I need to tell you. First, uh, this seminar will be recorded uh, at least for an hour. Then after, after this hour, we'll, uh, we'll turn the uh, recording off and we'll keep, uh, we'll keep on with a, a more informal discussion. Uh, second thing is please can everybody mute themselves? Uh, so I'm going to do it now. Uh, so, uh, but you can, uh, uh, you can still keep your, your camera on so that uh, Nikhil uh, doesn't have the impression of talking to a, a wall. Uh, okay, and so if you have questions, so I, I guess Nikhil will, uh, you know, every uh, five minutes or so, uh, it would be nice for you to, to stop and ask for questions. You can, and to the participants, you can also use the chat if you want to ask some questions or simply unmute yourself uh, when, you have, uh, when you have one question. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything. So without further ado, Nikhil, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. I'm happy to be talking about my paper here. A um, couple of qualifiers. I have never given a Zoom seminar, so if I, if I start to uh, break uh, social protocol, please just remind me to uh, ask questions, uh, ask questions, unmute yourself, I'll, I'm happy to ask. Um, uh, secondly, the paper's in a, a major revision. I'm going to present the, the unrevised version, um, but uh, I'll point out at various points where the, where the revision is, is taking the work. Um, okay, so to motivate, oops, um, I need not tell this esteemed audience that online rating platforms are everywhere these days. So. A uh, few examples, Yelp and Expedia for services. RateMDs uh, allows uh, patients to rate their medical doctors. And Zomato is an online restaurant platform, much like Yelp. And uh, much has been made in the literature, of course, about the welfare gains that we've all enjoyed as a result of these platforms coming online. So they mitigate classic market frictions, such as search frictions. They allow uh, trading counterparties to meet more efficiently and informational frictions, which will be the focus in this paper. So in particular, um, through a, a wealth of previously generated feedback, they allow consumers to make very informed choices about their products. So here's an example. Uh, this is a restaurant on Yelp. <clears throat> it has a four-star rating, uh, four-star four rating, but crucially, after over four and a half thousand reviews. Okay, so presumably that's a lot of valuable information for consumers to base their product choice on. On the other hand, uh, a new restaurant that's just opened down the road faces a very different online profile. So they have a great star rating, as you can see, five stars, but they only have three reviews, okay? And it might thus be that after just a handful of bad reviews, faced with the choice between these two options, uh, consumers flock to the well-established incumbent, okay? If the situation is really dire, this might mean that the new entrant shuts down uh, just after a, a very short period of time. What's worse, they might see this all coming in the first place and think to themselves, why should I bother um, you know, incurring the fixed costs of buying the equipment and all the cooking stuff and whatnot? They might not even enter the market in the first place, okay? So this, this problem is going to be the heart of the paper. Uh, it's this combination of incomplete information regarding the quality of firm's products as well as user-generated user feedback, giving rise to uh, barriers to entry for new firms in these sort of ratings markets. Okay, and in particular, the problem for welfare is if these high-quality firms don't enter or they exit uh, uh, too early from the market. So the, the, the problem that I just outlined bears a strong resemblance to what we would call the cold start problem uh, in, in online learning. Uh, so this is where uh, products sort of um, enter a reputational trap. 
So if a product has a poor rating or a poor re reputation, then people won't sample it because they don't want to, to buy the thing. And thus, it doesn't have the chance to update its rating. And so it gets stuck in this trap, OK? Um, the novelty of the exercise in my paper is to effectively endogenize the quality distribution facing um, the samplers or the consumers by allowing firms to enter and exit the market, OK? And um, <clears throat> this, this entry margin that I'm, I'm focusing on here is empirically very relevant. So there's a, a, a bunch of papers on this topic, one in particular from the JPE uh, a few years back now, looking at markets that bear a strong resemblance to the ones that I analyze. Uh, and showing that if you subsidize entry, then this can lead to huge substantial uh, consumer welfare gains through an increase in the product variety uh, in the market. <clears throat> okay, so to, to focus down, these are the two questions that I'm going to use to, to frame my talk. So firstly, how do consumer reviews shape the dynamic incentives for firms to participate in markets? And secondly, how should these platforms design their rating systems in light of the, the forces I've just identified? Okay, so a couple of quotes from Zomato um, that echo these uh, questions. So on the first one, they say, the penalty from a bad review could have, been a be could have been a death sentence, especially for a new place, as a low rating may prevent new customers from visiting the restaurant. Okay, so this is uh, really speaking to that cold start problem that I identified. And on the second, more um, normative question, they go on to say, whilst we have placed a very heavy focus on helping our users discover great food, one of our core missions for the next decade is to ensure the long-term success of restaurants. Okay, so clearly accounting for both sides of the market when they design their, uh, their ratings platforms. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of what I'm gonna do today, and then I'll, I'll pause for some early questions. Um, the setting, in a nutshell, we're going to have firms making entry and exit choices. They're going to be of hidden quality, and this quality is going to be gradually revealed via consumer feedback. Uh, there will be a platform that um, receives this feedback and controls uh, its dissemination through firm-specific ratings. Okay? These ratings are obviously going to be reflective of the underlying quality of, of the firms. Uh, and consumers finally are going to use these ratings to decide on which firms to, to visit and thus uh, <coughs> buy products from. Okay, so that's uh, the, the model in a nutshell. So the first part of the talk is really going to focus on the positive theory. And here I, I analyze a regime that I call full transparency. So this is where the platform uh, mechanically just posts every consumer review that it receives, okay? I'm going to fully characterize outcomes here. Um, I'm going to talk, probably not prove, existence and uniqueness of equilibria. And, um, and I'm just going to flesh out a few of the more empirical, uh, interesting empirical predictions that the, that the um, uh, equilibrium model uh, gives us. But the, the, the main takeaway from this positive section is that there's going to be an informational misallocation uh, in equilibrium under full transparency. So effectively, um, the wrong firms are going to be receiving feedback, okay? By this, I'm going to mean that the well-established firms who don't value feedback much are, not, are, are going to get all of the feedback because, um, um, because they're getting all the consumer reviews. Uh, but the young firms that value feedback a lot are not going to be getting enough feedback. Okay? People aren't going to be going there enough. So this misallocation is effectively going to depress the incentives for firms to participate in these markets. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to the, the normative theory, the design part. And here I'm going to um, introduce the second best problem faced by the platform, whereby they can shape uh, firms' ratings in order to uh, affect market outcomes. And the balancing act here for the platform is going to be, on the one hand, providing consumers with accurate information, and on the other hand, encouraging these high-quality firms to actually remain active in the market and participate in the first place. And the, the main takeaway of the entire paper, really, is that simple censorship policies are going to be shown to dominate fully transparent ratings. So, of course, I'll be more formal later, but effectively, by suppressing the reviews of well-established firms, this um, stimulates entry incentives by making the, the task of climbing the ratings ladder, as I call it, uh, easier, um, effectively. 
Okay. So I think the main contribution of the paper is really in, in looking at this interaction between information design and industry dynamics. Okay, this market-wide level, which we haven't really seen before in the literature. Okay, so before going into the model, uh, I shall take a, a, a quick pause for questions on the on the motivation. Okay, so the model. Uh, we're going to be in continuous time and we're going to be looking at steady state outcomes. Uh, my firms are going to be of uh, a hidden type, uh, theta, and they're either good or bad. Okay, crucially, when the firm enters, neither the firm nor the market or the platform knows this type. So P0 is going to denote the fraction of incoming firms that are of the high type. And we're going to be learning about this hidden type through consumer feedback, consumer reviews. Okay, so for each firm, we're going to have this uh, cumulative stochastic process, XT. In, under full transparency, this thing is going to be totally public and known to everyone. And it's going to increment according to the following um, diffusion process. So for those of you who've seen this sort of thing, that's fine. Uh, I'll just uh, go through the elements. Um, so the terms in black, can you see my pointer, my hand waving around? Okay, so the terms in black on the right-hand side are basically telling us that each consumer is going to have an experience and thus leave a review that is normally distributed, centered on the underlying type of the firm. Okay, so this captures the idea that um, if you go to a good firm, on average, you're going to have a better meal. Okay, but there is some noise in the process. Uh, so, you know, maybe the, the chef has a bad day or something like this, okay? Um, and thus gives rise to the, the inference problem at the, the heart of the model. So that's each review. The lambda term is, is um, <clears throat> possibly more important, and it captures effectively the rate at which reviews are being generated for the firm uh, in a given instant, okay? So you can think of uh, lambda as the number of reviews that are posted per unit time. Under full transparency, uh, lambda is going to be the sum of two terms. So the first term, pi t, is just the quantity of sales. Okay, so if 50 consumers buy from the firm in an instant, then we're gonna have 50 reviews left. The epsilon is uh, a background rate, a constant background rate of reviewing. Okay, so as you can see, there's no subscript t, so this thing is constant across all firms. Um, irrespective of their rating or their age. Uh, and the way to think about Epsilon is as a sort of unmodeled mass of consumers who just randomly decide on which firm to, to go to and to leave a review at any instant. Okay, so maybe they're impatient, maybe they decide not to use the platform in that moment, maybe they're with friends, okay, whatever. But they do leave a review, okay? But the key in this, in this technology here is that um, the rate of feedback for a firm is intimately connected to the quantity of sales, okay? So because the type space is binary, um, a sufficient statistic, um, so this is standard, a sufficient statistic for the, the distribution of quality for a given firm is, uh, is a scalar, PT, and this is just the expected quality of the firm given all the information encoded in the reviews that we see, okay? And I'm going to call this expected quality the rating of the firm. Now, because we all use these platforms, I want to make very clear the distinction between what I call a rating and the star rating that we see in these online settings. Okay, so to go back to an earlier example, if I have a firm, uh, two firms, one with a four-star rating after one review and one with a four-star rating after a million reviews, Okay, in my terminology, they have different ratings, but they have obviously the same star rating. Okay, so ratings captures both the average star rating and the quantity of reviews that it has uh, at the firm. Okay, so that's an important distinction there. You can think, obviously, this is uh, uh, reputation if you're more comfortable with that terminology. Okay, so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Obviously, I'm not familiar with this uh, this kind of this way of modeling the, the, the rating, the, the cumulative process. 
can we think of it as a sort of a limit case of a scenario in which you receive many signals, many independent signals, and you and you learn the type? Of Absolutely, yeah. So the way that you come up with this diffusion um, equation here is you can do it through a discrete time limit. Um, so effectively, in each moment, um, there are lambda t iid normal signals, mm -hmm. all centered on theta with a standard deviation sigma. Okay, so you can think about this as a discrete time process where in every instant you get lambda many uh, iid normal signals, and then you take the limit, the continuous time limit. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And then, if I may, while, uh, while I have the mic, there's a couple of questions um, in the chat. So one from Michael Comer, who said that you're calling it feedback, but you also imply that the firms will improve their service as an answer. Very good. So in this, in this baseline setting, um, there is no uh, effort or investment choice whereby the firm can um, update their quality, right? So in particular, this theta type here, is uh, invariant over the course of the firm's life, okay? So I've studied extensions where <clears throat> the firm can invest in their quality or they can uh, substitute for theta using effort like in a career concerns model. We can talk about that a bit later, but absolutely in the baseline model, there's no, there's no uh, quality response. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question from Muslim. Um, so do you not allow for silent transaction? Not sure what uh, uh, so the way I interpret this question is, so under full transparency, any consumer that has an experience leaves a review and is posted. So in that sense, there's no silent transaction, if I've understood that question correctly. Was, uh, Lemon, was that the meaning of your question? So, um, yes, so that's fine. Yes, good. So when we get to the design part, this is going to be crucial. So effectively, what we're going to be doing is suppressing some of the reviews that are left by consumers. So they will be silent by design. Yeah. Sorry, can I, uh, Jacques, can I intervene? The model would be the same if 25% uh, of the consumers left a review. The only thing you need, isn't it, is that the lambda is proportional to uh, yeah, pi. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. As long as it's I guess as long as it's an increasing function, I mean, so I guess this ties back to Alex's question. So this functional form for this uh, incrementing process here is actually micro-founded. It's not that I've chosen something ad hoc. It's literally, if there were lambda many reviews, then uh, this is the limiting equation that you get. But yes, I mean, the, the basic idea of the exercise would be unchanged if it was just something proportional. Yeah. But proportionality is not sufficient. I mean, it, 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 it rating should be unbiased random, huh? right? It, oh, that could well, be, you know, if there would be systematic rating biases, uh, then there would be there would be clearly uh, proportionality right. not be sufficient, right? So, so I, I guess the way I interpreted um, uh, the question was uh, just cut the number of reviews that are being left by some constant proportional scale rather than I get to choose ex post. If it's a good review, I leave it. If it's a bad review, I don't. Things like that. Okay, yes. So obviously, if we bias things in that way, it changes the message very much. But uh, the way I interpreted the question was just uh, as long as the rate of feedback is proportional to the quantity of sales in that sense, then, then nothing changes. Um, okay. So, so Nico, I, I, uh, one <laughs> more question. So here in your formulation, uh, when you have higher lambda, you get a higher error term as well, right? Uh, um, error. I mean, uh, I mean uh, you have lambda entering into your um, uh, error. Oh, yeah. You mean here? Yeah? Yes. Well, well, yes. Yeah. So if you think about when I add, uh, if I sum up. 10 IID normal signals, I multiply both the mean and the standard deviation, right? When the, the formula for adding up normal signals, right? That's, that's, just, that's just mechanical. Uh, no, so what I mean is like, okay, if you get this 10 signal, so the, the way that you're interpreting that, if they, the 10 will have different uh, random shots, ah. when you're summing them, you have to actually get the lower error term, not? No, right. So if they had different, so again, I'm assuming the consumers have IID experiences. 
identical. So they, they have the same distribution. So they, they share the same sigma in particular, right? Like they're not yeah, getting different. No, I mean, if this error is that they, so here you're assuming that the error is the same for everyone, right? This DZ is the same. So like if the, I guess. No, 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 no. The realization of the shock can be, I mean, the realization of the shock is random, of course. Okay. Right? Yeah, this is just, I mean, you want to think about this equation as effectively being ex ante in, in the moment, right? Like if I add 10 IID signals with this mm -hmm. distribution, then this is what you get, right? That's, that's, that's really the way to, to think about this. But uh, I think I'd better continue uh, if, that, if that's okay. Um, um, we can, if, there, if there are still more outstanding questions at the end, then um, I'm happy to, happy to talk. Um, but just in the interest of getting to the main results. So uh, given all of this technology here, um, what we're interested in is looking at how ratings are updated in time. Okay, so we apply Ito's lemma to Bayes' rule. So we take the prior belief of the firm's uh, quality, and we use all the signals in the, in the review process, and you get this law of motion for how ratings are updated in continuous time. Okay, so this also, I guess, speaks to um, <clears throat> Mariam's question sort of indirectly. So a couple of points of interpretation of, of, of this equation. So firstly, as you can see, the more reviews the firm gets, the faster the rating moves. Okay, so uh, that is really the, 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 the key force here. If I get 50 reviews, then that's more information. And so my rating on average moves more. Okay. Similarly, if each review is more precise, then my ratings move faster. Okay, so if the New York Times critic turns up and he gives me a, a, a very accurate review, then I know instantaneously what theta is. And thirdly, ratings are stochastic and uh, uh, they're, they're, they take a diffusion form themselves. Okay, so they can go up and down depending on the, the reviews that are realized for the firm. Okay, so the payoffs for the firm. At the point of entry, they pay a, a fixed entry cost. Once they're operating, they have to cover a, a constant flow cost of C. In the baseline setting, their revenue is simply going to be equal to the quantity of sales. And this quantity is bounded above by an exogenous capacity constraint. Okay, so you can think of a firm as a restaurant and um, they have only 50 seats at the table at the restaurant, I, I, I mean. Um, so later on, um, I'm going to fully endogenize prices into this model um, because that's, that's very important. And um, the, the, the revision is going to make the pricing model um, a far more prominent. So I'm, I'm going to talk about this in some detail later on. Firms discount at rate rho. Uh, they also face a constant hazard rate of exogenously separating from the market of delta. These are both strictly positive, I should have written. I'm going to make some very basic assumptions on parameters that without which the market would be completely empty. Okay, so if the flow cost of operating were greater than the sellout revenue, then no firm would ever enter because they would make um, losses. And if the cost of entering was greater than the present discounted value of selling out forever, which is what this is, then again, no firm would ever enter. Okay, so these are very minimal assumptions. What are the strategies for the firm? So uh, at the point of entry, they decide whether to enter or not. I'm in a continuum model. And so this takes the form of an entry rate, eta. And then if and when they're active, they decide uh, when to exit, okay? So uh, this takes the form of a, a, an optimal stopping time that's um, measurable with respect to the review process, okay? So uh, as is common in these settings, this boils down to a threshold problem. So think about the firm's problem as having the state variable, which is their rating. So their rating goes up and down depending on the reviews they get. If their rating drops sufficiently low, then in expectation their um, uh, <coughs> continuation revenues are going to drop before, uh, below their continuation costs and they exit the market, okay? And I'm going to denote this endogenous variable as P lower bar. So finally, because I have a mass of firms in, in equilibrium, I have to keep track of this uh, um, distribution of firms over the different ratings that they can be at, okay? And because I'm in steady state, we're dropping the subscript Ts, okay? 
So f of p is going to be the density of firms that reside at a given rate in p. And it's defined over the interval of ratings over which the firms are, are active, okay? So consumers uh, are going to be in fixed measure, they're short-lived and they're risk neutral. And they're going to be solving a problem that I call directed search subject to random rationing. Okay, so um, I believe, unless it's changed, I wasn't in your talk, Mary, but in your paper, which was delivered in the seminar series a while back, uh, it's, a, it's a similar sort of um, similar technology. So um, effectively, consumers can see the entire range of firms in the market. So they, they see F of P, this is the distribution of firms, and they decide which firm to go to. Now, if 100 consumers turn up to a firm with a, a capacity constraint of 50, then you get randomly rationed. So this is what uh, this expression for this uh, theta of P is, okay? So uh, in that case, you have a one in two chance of being served and getting your expected value of consumption, which is just the current rating. Or in a one in two chance, you don't get served and you just get zero, okay? So that's the, that's the technology with which um, consumers are, are, are searching, okay? So the, whilst this sounds sort of complicated, uh, the solution to this also boils down to another threshold rule, okay? So there's going to be a consumption threshold, P star, below which consumers don't turn up to these firms. So if their rating is, is worse than P star, then consumers don't turn up. Above P star, they turn up, and as P increases, they're going to turn up in increasing numbers, okay? So why is this? Effectively, they're going to trade off the probability of being served against the expected quality of consumption, okay? So I can either go to the best restaurant in town, but maybe I won't be served because the queue is too long, or I can go to a worse restaurant and be served almost instantaneously. And in equilibrium, because I have free choice over any firm in the market, I have to be indifferent between all of the firms that I go to, okay? So one byproduct of this modeling choice is that the expression for consumer welfare at an equilibrium is very straightforward. It's just equal to P star. Why is that? So P star is the rating at which consumers go to and a guaranteed service with probability one, okay? But I've just said that consumers are indifferent between these firms and any other firm they turn up to. So that means they have to be getting P star in expectation from any firm they turn up to. Okay, and given that there's a measure one of them, this, uh, this gives you consumer welfare. Okay, so keep that in mind when, when we do the design problem later on. So before I pause for another round of questions, I think this is the, the, the most non-trivial uh, modeling choice that I make, in, in, in my opinion, so I, I like to justify it at this, at this point. There are a few reasons that I like it. Firstly, I think it's a natural trade-off in many of the, the settings that I have in mind, in particular services, uh, queuing versus quality. Um, secondly, it's very tractable, as I've just explained. Um, P star is, is giving you consumer welfare. It allows the model to be solved analytically. Uh, thirdly, this is, this is important. Um, I'm not hard coding into the model any other friction other than um, the, 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 um, the agency issue of entry and exit. Okay, so there's no random search in here whereby consumers can't control where they go to. Um, and fourthly, as you'll see later, it's very easy to endogenize prices into this model and uh, it remains just as tractable. Okay, so I'll pause for a couple of questions if there are any. Well, if there are no questions, I'd like, I'd like to, to, to emphasize that this is really a cute specification, uh, Nikhil, for restaurants, but it's, uh, it's not a good specification for other, for quite other good you know, for restaurants it's fantastic or for hotels yeah uh, for, for fixed capacity outlets it's it's great mm -hmm. I, yeah absolutely no so for like product markets if you're thinking about amazon where where sellers yeah. can obviously scale their quantities then um it's uh it's a uh, I, I, well so i i want to be um balanced about this i i think the the um I think the, the, the larger issue might be the, the absence of prices. So I would say with, with, with uh, traditional products, obviously the pricing margin is, is uh, more active. I think with restaurants, 
for, for whatever reason it is, prices aren't as flexible. And so you do see excess demand in, in, in service industries. So there's, there's a paper by, um, a recent paper by Brad Lewis and um, Google Service that shows this empirically. Um, but for products, I think the better model would be something that had uh, at least pricing in it. And I'll talk about that later. The capacity constraint, I don't think, as long as you have prices, I don't think it's as much of an issue. Um, I think you can allow for um, for a quantity choice subject to you know a constant marginal cost, and that that would be okay. Um, but you're right for product markets. I I think the pricing model is a better fit in any case. So to be continued later on. Yeah. Um, okay. So to dig into a bit of the analysis, um, <clears throat> I have about ten minutes. Do I? I better I better I better get a move on. Uh, or 50. A, bit, a bit more, I mean, you, there, there were many questions. So I'll give you oh, good. Oh, that's very kind. Okay. So um, let's look at the problem of the firm. I'm going to draw their value function. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, we have the rating of the firm, and the y-axis is going to be their, their continuation value. So firstly, let's think about their flow profit function. So we now know that consumers have this threshold policy whereby below P star, they're not turning up. And so the, uh, the firm is just incurring their fixed cost. And above P star, uh, they're turning up and they're queuing. Now, as I've just described, um, <clears throat> from an individual firm's point of view, they're selling a capacity as soon as they go above P star. Okay, so they're just selling out. And in this setting without prices, um, their, their revenue is just going to be at, uh, at a maximum, okay, above P star. So this step profit function combined with gradual learning through consumer reviews is going to turn into this uh, S-shaped continuation value. So it's convex, concave. Um, the final point on this graph is just a free entry condition, OK? So uh, the value of entering for a firm, which is V of P0, has to be equal to the cost of entering at an equilibrium, OK? But the shape of this graph is, is important. I want to just stress it and go through it in a bit of detail right now. So think about firms with a rating of above P star. Uh, these guys, as I've said, are selling out. They have nothing more to gain from having a higher rating. And in fact, they have everything to lose from their rating dropping. Okay, if their rating drops below P star, they're gonna lose all of their consumers and with it, their revenue. Okay, so these firms actually don't want any updating to their rating at all. They don't like information. On the other hand, um, the firms below P star, they're making a loss. Okay, the only way they're going to make any revenue in this market is if their rating climbs above P star. Okay, so from their point of view, they want information as fast as possible. Either they go above P star, or if they turn out to be a bad firm, they want to quit as soon as possible and mitigate their losses. Okay. Unfortunately, in equilibrium, you get the reverse profile. Okay, so whereas firms want a lot of information at the bottom and not a lot at the top, they get the reverse because all the consumers are turning up to the best firms and leaving reviews there. And the worst firms are just ticking over with this background rate of learning of Cylon. Okay, so this is the misallocation that I mentioned in the, in the motivation. Uh, for those of you who like equations, this is the HJV equation of the firm. Uh, so their flow uh, profits are if they sell out, if their rating is high enough, then they sell out. But they have to bear their operating costs nonetheless. And this is the dynamic component because they're forward-looking. And um, just intuitively, you can see in the concave region, they don't like information. So their second derivative is negative. And in the convex region, they do like information. So that shows that they have positive option value from continuing. These are just um, optimality conditions for the, the stopping problem. OK, so the, the other important equilibrium object is this ratings distribution. OK, so in a steady state, we have this constant inflow at rate eta of firms. Firms are exiting either voluntarily at P lower bar or involuntarily through attrition, and it gives rise to this uh, invariant distribution of firms over ratings. So it looks a bit like this. They come in at P0. If they get a sequence of bad reviews, their rating drops. If it drops low enough, they exit at P lower bar. And of course, there are no firms below that. If they get a sequence of good reviews, then their rating increases towards P star. Okay, 
Now, at the moment, all of the firms in this graph are ticking along at the background rate of Epsilon, okay? They haven't actually secured any positive revenue yet. So at PSTAR, two, two important things happen. One is more important than the other. Uh, the first is there's a discontinuity in the, in the density. This is technical and due to the fact that uh, the, the rate of feedback steps up from zero to lambda bar at that point. But the more important feature is that the distribution starts to flatten. Okay, you can see that it's a bit flatter here and it's a bit steeper to the left, okay? I'll talk more about that in the next slide on predictions. But in summary, um, in this positive section, I'm not gonna have time to prove this at all, uh, but I can show that a stationary equilibrium always exists and is unique. And it has these features of positive uh, finite rates of entry and exit and uh, congestion of these high rates of firms, okay? So there are, there are uh, quite a few um, empirical predictions that the model makes. I'm just listing a few of the novel ones here. There are others that I don't list that are, that are shared by um, other models in the literature, by like Hoppenheim and um, Jovanovic 82. I think the key one is this prediction about the distribution of uh, ratings. The fact that the tail parameter to the right is fatter than the tail parameter at the left. Okay, so um, that is an empirically testable prediction. Actually, in an earlier version of this paper, I had an empirical section. Um, so the fact, uh, so uh, uh, the solution of the fixed point at the heart of the equilibrium problem turns out to be a, 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 a series of linear equations. So it's basically a, a matrix inversion. So you can solve the, the thing analytically. And so you can solve uh, uh, you can do parametric estimation of the model, basically. Um, okay, so that's the end of the positive section. Uh, I'd better pause for a few more questions before I go into ratings design. Okay, so now I'm going to endow the platform with a, an objective and a tool to which uh, to, to meet this objective, okay? So my platform for the moment is interested in consumer welfare. As we know, this in equilibrium is going to be given by this P star. In, in steady state, of course, consumer welfare is equal to overall welfare because firms get um, uh, uh, zero profit because of the free entry condition. <clears throat> but I, I want you to think about consumer welfare. It's, it's a cleaner objective. But more importantly, the instrument that I endow my platform with is filtering the reviews that come in to each firm to distort the way that the firm's rating evolves over time, okay? So I'm going to be technical, um, uh, but I'm, try I'm gonna try and just breeze over the technicalities to get onto the result. So in all generality, a ratings policy is just a progressively measurable process um, <clears throat> subject to the reviews of the, the, the um, that the firm receives. I'm going to make no progress at this level of generality, so I'm going to look at a very restricted class of ratings policies called simple policies, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna describe these in words. It's, it's, it's easier to do so. So think about the platform as receiving, let's say it gets 100 reviews from consumers at a given instant, okay? The platform effectively commits ahead of time to throw out a fixed fraction of these reviews. Okay, so this goes back to the question about silent experiences before, okay? So it can commit to, let's say, throwing out 50% of them, it can throw out none of them, it can throw out all of them, okay? Um, so whilst this is obviously a restriction, I allow the, the, the fraction that it throws out to be a fairly general function of the firm's current rating, okay? So this is a technical novelty that goes beyond other papers in the dynamic ratings literature uh, that typically um, look at sort of uh, time invariant uh, or, or, or ratings invariant um, functions. Okay, so these are simple policies. Uh, I'm going to call a simple policy, I'm gonna say it involves certification if above some rating P tilde, it throws out Oh, sorry, this should not be a lambda. This should be an R, I beg your pardon. Um, it throws out all the reviews, okay? 
So a firm gets to a certain rating P tilde, from then on, every review is suppressed. And if every review is suppressed, of course, the rating remains constant until the firm dies. Okay. And I'm going to say um, a policy is all or nothing if it certifies above P tilde and below P tilde, it includes every review that the firm receives. Okay, so it either uh, it puts in all the reviews or none of the reviews. That's why it's all or nothing. Okay. So why do I look at this class of policies? Um, on the one hand, it allows for the, the key comparison, so it nests full transparency. If you put R equal to 1 everywhere, of course, this boils down to the full transparency regime. So I can compare meaningfully. On the other hand, um, anecdotally, I've had the chance to talk to some of these platforms, and uh, it seems like this is a sort of uh, a practical set of policies that they, they might think about using in reality. Just throwing out a fraction of the reviews that come in for firms. And certification obviously has natural um, analogs in eBay, the top seller program, in Rotten Tomatoes, uh, the certified fresh, this sort of thing. Okay, so this is effectively the main result of the main paper, of the paper, of the baseline setting. And it says that uh, the optimal simple, simple ratings policy is all or nothing at P star. Okay, so in particular, a corollary is that full transparency is, is uh, strictly dominated. So I'm not going to have time to go through the details of this. I'm going to give you the intuition as I, as I see it. So think about a ratings policy as providing incentives to firms through two different channels. On the one hand, there's a sort of direct channel, which is profits. So the policy shapes this uh, where consumers end up going. And that obviously shapes the, the, the profits of the firm. Okay, so in particular, the higher is P star, the lower are the profits of the firm over time. Okay, because it has to get to a higher standard to achieve uh, positive revenue. But there's the second channel, which is this informational channel. Okay, so ratings policies affect the, the dynamic evolution of firms across different ratings. Okay, so this is sort of the, uh, the second dynamic component of their value function, whereas this is the first component, okay? Now, the platform is trying to target P star. It's trying to maximize P star through its choice of R, okay? That's their problem. But as I've just said, if you shift P star up, this is effectively giving consumers high surplus, because it is consumer welfare, at the loss of firms. A higher P star lowers um, the profits of firms because they have to get to a higher, a higher rating in order to start getting revenue. Okay, so it's depressing the incentives for firms to participate. But the, the platform likes there to be firms in the market. This is an equilibrium problem. Okay, so the higher is the entry rate of firms and the lower is the exit threshold. The more firms there are in the market, the more firms there are the more capacity there is to serve consumers at the highest end of the quality spectrum. So P star can go back up, okay? So on the one hand, the platform wants to set P star as high as possible, but on the other hand, it wants to provide incentives for firms to get into the market, okay? So it's kind of not doing good stuff for the firms in the first channel. The result is it has to compensate them with incentives through the informational channel. Okay, so now we can think of choosing R as effectively the optimal information policy for firms. When do they want information? When do they not? Now, we already know that. We know that V has this S-shaped policy, so we want it to be fast and slow. And that's effectively why you center all the reviews as soon as they get above P star. Okay, so that's the, the intuition of the main result uh, in a nutshell. Um, I better pause here before I go to... Uh, the pricing extension. So, Nikhil, uh, we're at uh, we're already past forty minutes. So, oh. unfortunately, I, I believe that we won't have time for the pricing extension. So, we, if you want to conclude, maybe now would be a good time. okay. Okay, sure. Uh, for those interested, obviously, read the pricing extension in the in the paper. The basic point is that there are still um, gains from suppressing reviews for the for the highest rated firms in the market. Um, so the main result still goes through in some sense. Okay, so I better summarize. I studied this problem with incomplete information about firm quality 
uh, combined with consumer reviews giving rise to these barriers to entry for firms. I looked at this design problem whereby a platform shapes the industry through ratings. And the takeaway really from um, the main result is that these upper censorship policies can dominate fully transparent ratings. Uh, the idea being that by providing the correct incentives for firms to participate, this stimulates entry into the platform and ultimately um, improves consumer welfare. Uh, I think there are lots of applications. I obviously don't have time to talk about these, but excited to work on them in, in follow-up work. Uh, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, so now you can unshare your screen. And uh, Mayam Saidi uh, is going to discuss. Do you need to share your slides as well? No. No? OK. So the floor is yours. You have five minutes. OK. Yeah, I think I will probably even use uh, less than that. Uh, so here uh, I have one main uh, question and a couple of uh, smaller ones. So the uh, main question that I have, I guess you can think of your problem uh, as um, how information can solve congestion externality. Uh, because in the baseline model, the problem that you have is the queuing at the top and consumers who are not served and they're not going to go to the uh, sellers with your, let's say, uh, reputation. So on the other hand, you're using directed search, which, is, which was introduced to combat the exactly congestion externalities. And I want to know why you still have this inefficiency uh, in the market and what's the source of inefficiency? So that's um, mainly my main question here. I think, uh, so one thing that I was thinking might be the reason is uh, the matching function that you have, which here is uh, sort of Leontief. So if you go to um, firms, uh, so for example, the P at Star firm, you get matched 100% of the time. So there's no reason to go to, uh, an expert, go to any firm below P at Star. But if you have, for example, something like Cop Douglas, other kind of matching functions, uh, then you would, uh, um, every firm is gonna have some uh, inflow of firms other than inflow of consumers other than the epsilon. So the uh, rate of growth of your uh, reputation is not gonna be very small for firms below PSR. So that, that's, uh, uh, I want to know if you have tried other uh, kind of matching functions and if this problem exists uh, for them, or maybe this inefficiency is coming from another source that you can mm -hmm. uh, tell <clears throat> us. Uh, and, shall uh, I answer that or shall I wait? You should join. Yeah, to... let's, let's do that. Although I, I the might others forget. Are to... <laughs> much, uh, smaller points. Yeah. So, um, no, that's, a, that's obviously a very question. Um, I mean, uh, this is indeed why the pricing extension is, is very important. So the way I see this is a distinction between directed and competitive search. Um, uh, competitive search basically looks like my baseline model, but with price posting at the same time. Okay. And that's effectively how I put prices into the model. And so it turns the model into a fully competitive model. Okay. So mm -hmm. um, when you say that um, <clears throat> directed search was really designed to alleviate this kind of externality, uh, it's only if you have um, either bilaterally efficient uh, contracts or price posting in, in the model, right, which I don't have in the baseline. So there is congestion by, um, by choice because of the absence of flexible prices in the baseline. Okay, so uh, the point is, is when you put price setting into the model and it turns into a competitive search model, then that externality totally goes away. So one of the points I was going to say in the pricing extension is the congestion disappears um, mm -hmm. as soon as you put prices into the model. Of course, when a firm has excess demand, then it's just going to increase its price a little bit and soak up the queue that's outside its door and get more revenue. So there won't be any congestion in equilibrium. Nevertheless, you still have that um, uh, suppression can play a role in increasing consumer welfare. Okay, so uh, th that externality, it's, 
I think it's important to have both um, versions of the model in the analysis um, to the extent that they're both uh, sort of relevant to these settings, but they really complement each other because uh, they, they have fundamentally different market structures, as was asked earlier on with the products versus services. So yeah, I guess that's my answer to that. So have you also tried other matching platforms oh, or not? Right, sorry, yes. Um, so uh, no, the reason that I have it this way is that if you have smooth matching functions, mm -hmm. then the lambda, uh, which is the rate of information production, is going to be nonlinear um, and you can't solve the model. Uh, so effectively, this is one reason why the, the bang bang solution is very tractable, because it means that you're already solving for one threshold. Uh, that piece star threshold. Uh, so, but again, uh, I don't believe that uh, changing the matching technology for being a, a smoother thing is going to make any difference in terms of whether the efficiency is there or not. As soon as you put price posting into any directed search model, it's going to turn competitive and you're going to get rid of ex uh, congestion in equilibrium, I think. But uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so here, um, one um, other uh, a bit uh, more minor question is, uh, so here uh, for the cost, you are assuming that the cost is uh, independent of uh, market that you are serving in each period? Is that the, oh. uh, the C, is that important? Uh, would that uh, sort of change the results? So here, I guess the firms who are not uh, getting a lot of customers at the beginning, uh, they turn out to be um, losing a lot of uh, flow costs uh, and as a result would exit the market faster. Um, would that change I, yeah. the result? So, it's um, I, uh, I, so I guess, Having a fixed cost of operating is important, otherwise no firm would exit. Um, like if there was just a marginal cost of production, then I could scale my production down to zero and not exit. Um, but uh, uh, that said, the entry margin would still be there. So I, I haven't worked this out, but it, it might be that the main result is sort of un unchanged, even if you didn't have exit. But uh, I haven't thought about having the, the C, the operating cost as being a a function of anything like the rating or, or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. It would, of course, change the result to the extent that, um, I mean, it would dramatically complicate things because the, 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 the problem would not be a very well-behaved stopping problem. So I don't even know how the exit problem would look uh, in, in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so one other question. So here, um, when you're, um, I mean, it's something <laughs> mostly that I'm curious about. Uh, when you're drawing the uh, distribution of f of p, uh, mm -hmm. you're assuming that uh, p star is above p zero. Oh, right. But uh, it can be either way, right? Yeah. And I was Good. wondering if the problem is actually more serious when P star ends up being uh, above P zero than other way, because other way everyone is getting, even when you're entering, you still get uh, customers. Uh, it's yeah. just when you- No, that's a great question. That's a, that's a very good question. So the answer is no. Um, the reason being that really what's important here is that P zero is closer to P lower bar than the average quality in the market okay because of selection through exit the average firm is better than the average entrant mm -hmm. that's really what is important the fact that um you know the entrant is necessarily closer to the exit threshold so it only takes a handful of bad reviews for that guy to exit than the average firm in the market so there's an incumbency advantage just through that selection effect yeah but in equilibrium p star is unordered as you say quite rightly could be anywhere so if, if I may interrupt, sorry, but we're a bit over time uh, for, for the discussion. So thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, and maybe you. if you have other questions, you, you can ask them uh, later on. But now I'd like sure, to open sure. the floor to, to other questions, to other people. 
Um, so we have a, a question in the chat by Matthew. It's a long question, so if you don't mind, uh, yes. I'll, I'll, can Matthew ask the question? Are you there? And if not, uh, you can. Okay, so maybe, does anyone else have a question? And, and <laughs> Matthew. Uh, I'm very slow at reading, so uh, it could take me a while. Uh, <laughs> does anyone I do have, have a short question? I do have a short question, Alexander. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the, from what I see empirically, uh, one of the, or about one, from what I observe in, in when reading about ratings, uh, a standard policy adopted by individual firms is to buy ratings. Uh, I, I, I think I mentioned that to you last year in Gassensee, Nikhil, uh, uh, and buying ratings seems to have uh, uh, become enormously important in the entire online market uh, uh, world. Uh, if not buying ratings also by restaurants and by by offline services that are that are marketing online uh, yeah yeah no absolutely so so um uh so this uh, so uh, jacques mentioned this to me yesterday in fact so uh, there's a crucial distinction between buying good ratings good reviews and just buying a quantity of reviews so uh, there's this uh, ft article where uh, you know, lots of the best firms have been buying good reviews uh, effectively. Now, obviously, that just undermines the whole, um, you know, what's the word, effectiveness of the of the platform. Um, I guess just in terms of, my, I mean, there's a fascinating discussion to be had in general, but in terms of the current paper, um, you can see the baseline setting is providing guidance as to which firms might want to buy reviews and which firms might not, okay? So clearly the, the struggling firms and the new firms have a greater desire for quantity of reviews. Everyone wants good reviews, of course, but the struggling firms want more reviews than the, the well-established firms. So th that's the way that it informs this particular topic. But yeah, no, it's, th that force is totally absent from the current analysis, but it's very interesting. Obviously, yeah. Obviously it is. Uh, it, I'm just, yeah. Uh, so, so I have a question myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still struggling a bit to understand really the intuition for your main result about this uh, uh, cutoff. Uh, because in my mind, like a, a firm which already has, let's say, you know, a couple of thousand reviews, if you say, well, past, uh, past this number, uh, we won't add any reviews, it feels to me like it doesn't do much, right? Like if you have enough reviews already, people know your quality. And, and so I, I, I don't really understand what's the force that makes this. Uh, right. So I'm thinking, it, I'm thinking in the wrong terms. I don't know. Uh, no, no, no. It's a very, it's a valid question. I mean, I, I guess two quick answers. So firstly, the policy isn't saying at a particular number of reviews, I'm going to certify you, right? It's saying at a rating. So you could have been lucky and gotten there after 10 reviews, uh, right? Um, so that's the first thing. It's not just that it, it gives uh, firms with a large number of reviews an, an advantage in that sense. Secondly, um, the level of P star is completely arbitrary, right? So it's not, you know, you, I think you have in mind that P star might be very close to one, in which case you're right. Like it takes a long time to get there and then necessarily the firms would have had to have had a lot of reviews. Mm -hmm. um, but P star might be a very low certification threshold, right? So, I mean, that, that really just depends on the parameters of the model. So I think the point is, is that um, by certifying these firms, um, you know, a new entrant sees this and says, Oh, well, okay, so once I get to this level, I'm going to enjoy myself a lot more than under full transparency. So that provides me with greater incentives to come in in the first place, right? It, it's just, uh, it's a good policy for every firm in the market. Um, okay. mm -hmm. So I, 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 um, uh, I have read Matthew's question. I don't know if he's still there or if I should, I, I'll just, offer a, a general response, um, which is that, um, yes, of course, like, uh, you know, when 
Um, I talk about this result to people who design platforms, there's some suspicion because they value transparency above all else, right? I mean, uh, you know, they, they, there are other forces um, that aren't in my model at all. So you might think about platform competition and maybe that's a force towards transparency because uh, people don't like using platforms where they know they're being gamed or they know they're not getting all the information. So. Uh, there are various reasons that might push in the favor of transparency, of course, and I guess the way to take this paper is just I'm focusing on this one entry and exit margin and showing how that affects how you might think about uh, salient design as a response. But yeah, it's a, it's a valid question, of course. Okay, so our time is up uh, for at least the recorded part of the... Well, I stopped the, re the record? So yes, Marie-Hélène, you can... Yes, I stop it. <laughs> okay.